Good evening and welcome our Facebook friends to our second in a three-part series of how to become a comic book creator. Why are we doing that, you ask? Glad you did. It's part of the Mark Grunwald comic book creation competition that's put on in the Oshkosh area by the Oshkosh Public Library, Zeroni's, House of Heroes, EAA, and the Winnebago Area Literacy Council. This week we are here with Craig and Matt. They're gonna be talking about the artistry of comics. Last week we talked all about how to create a character, how to make the character speak for the rest of the story and how to fit it into the story. Go back to our Facebook page and watch both of those. We did one for youth and one for adults. The one for adults has more just specific tips. The ones for kids has a beautiful creation of Scott the Cat. But before we do that, Craig, Talia last week had a question about character development. When you are drawing a character, what would lead you to decide that character has to be very realistic looking? And when does the story lead you to be able to make a character that's a little bit more outlandish, a little bit more of a caricature? How do you as an artist decide that? Um, awesome question, Talia. Um, excellent. I'm, I was thinking about that after we had wrapped up last week. Um, one of the things that you want to think about is what is the feel of the story you're trying to tell? If you're trying to tell a story that has a feel that um, is mainly geared towards realism or, or something that's dramatically based or, or horror based or something of that nature, maybe you want to have your characters a little bit more realistic. Whereas if you're working from a, like um, what they traditionally would call a funny animal comics, um, you can absolutely have fun and make caricatures with that. So the more playful, the humor comics oftentimes will have some really big exaggerations. Um, so think about it. And the, one of the fun things that you can do too is if your story shifts from one genre to the next, you can actually have some changes in the story that you're learning from as well. So you're going from a serious, realistic style to a more playful. And right now with one of the stories that I'm working on, I'm actually going from a very hyper real style to a, a cartoonish style back and forth throughout that, all the way through. Matt, why don't you touch on that same question? Well, what I always go by is, uh what the character is asking for. So if I'm designing something, I kind of let the character speak for it. And if this is a, like you were kind of mentioning, if the character is a menacing character, or if it's somebody that's more playful or joyful, um, not just necessarily what's happening in the story, but where that character is. You know, so what I try and do in my comics is really do a lot of homework in creating the characters, kind of deciding, you know, what type of person they are, or maybe who they are, what their backstory is. And a lot of times that will inform me in terms of who this person is and, and in that decision, how I design it and how I draw it. Do I draw this person a little more, you know, crinkly and, and realistic looking with hair and all of this, or is it just big circle eyes and, you know, a shape for a head and a mouth and, and it's, you know, more simplistic. So you can, you can do it both ways. You know, you can do talk real seriously with a cartoony look and you can do vice versa. So it, it gives you a lot of latitude. And I kind of liked what you had mentioned too, that it doesn't always have to be the same throughout the whole book. As long as the character is recognizable, you know, so like maybe, you know, they've always got a hat on or they've always got a beard or something. So you know when you're transitioning from style, it still works. But I kind of let character, you know, the concept of character inform the look of, of these people as opposed to, you know, maybe an outside aesthetic. Awesome. Awesome. Matt, I want to start out with um, a story about what ties you personally to um, the comics world. Well, I think like most kids, you know, it, you got stuck on the couch watching, you know, cartoons in the on Saturday mornings or after school. Uh, so I was very aware of superheroes and all of that, but I didn't really have any comics. I didn't know anything. Um, I started taking along with my mom to the grocery store, kind of like the same story you hear from a lot of people. And there was a rack of comics. And the first one I ever got was actually, um, it was a, a adaption of The Empire Strikes Back. So this would have been, that came out in 1980. So it must have been in 1980. I would have been, I don't know, uh, six or seven years old. 
And uh, yeah, first comic was Empire Strikes Back adaption by Al Williamson and Archie Goodwin. Um, and I just loved it. I just loved how it was, how cool it was and how much different it was than the movie. So much, you know, there were all these worlds were kind of fleshed out more. Um, so I kind of got caught in the imagination part of it, you know, that there was this whole side of it that was beyond what I saw on the movie screen, you know, at the outdoor theater that I saw that movie in. Super cool. Um, and of course, we are children of the Star Wars, uh, <laughs> original Star Wars trilogy. One of the reasons that I wanted to have Matt come in and talk is because he has really got a, a great out understanding of some of the professional processes that were used to make comic books. And I'm going to start out in a kind of an, in a weird way. I'm going to start out with actually talking about comic strips. And this was a book that Matt and I did with two other friends. And what we did with this book is kind of a cool transition from story to the artwork. Because we all took the same script, each one of us, and we each translated it without looking at what the other person's artwork looked like. So this was Chris's work. And then right here was Matt's work from the same script. Here was my work and here was Joel's work. And this whole book is filled with different examples of the same strips for each different page. And now the reason I wanted to show you guys that is because it really emphasizes the importance of the artist and the writer too, for that sake. I mean, the writer comes up with a basic concept but then it's up to the right, the artist to actually start shaping it, to put it together in a very visual form. Um, our original comic strips that we did, uh, Matt, what size were these? Uh, they're 17 inches long and then five and a half inches tall. So it's half of an 11 by 17 sheet of paper. And then the box, the artwork itself? It's about 15 by three. 15 by three. Or 15 three, by four, I think. 15 by four and a half, maybe. Yeah, that could um, be. So you can kind of see that how these and, and uh, the styles that I was doing these in were all kind of pretty traditional as far as, although this one here tells a story in one, two, three, four different parts, but there's not a panel break in there. And sometimes we'll talk a little bit about the importance of those panel breaks too, because that gives you a breakdown in time. And this one here, you kind of have to understand how comic strips work in order to, to sort of understand that. For these, this was a second project that we did uh, together as a group, but we used public domain characters to make these comic strips. And this was here was the last one that I did. It was a Zorro strip, and I really like how it went from one panel to the next. But now I did put the panel breaks in there, and I also did an ink wash on the top of it. So we're going to talk a little bit about how you can potentially finish your artwork as we're going through as well. This is a page from a Ren and Stimpy comic. I don't know if they're making any new Ren and Stimpy cartoons. It's a shame because it was funny. But if you look at this, this is a kind of a breakdown. It's only got four panels on it. This is very much so almost like a, a comic strip. And you guys, the reason I wanted to start with comic strips is because it's easy to transition from telling that three panel story to possibly telling another one and telling another one. And pretty soon you have a whole page of stories that are done in three panels comic strips. So you could tell a whole page of our, our, our story using three panel comic strips. We've got a couple of artists that are listening with us today and I wanted to kind of put them uh, up to a challenge while we're talking here and hopefully you guys can multitask while, you, while you're listening. Um, I challenge all of you artists out there to make a panel for me. This is gonna be Gary. Gary peeked out of the box and was surprised. That's what I wanna see you guys drawing in the next couple of minutes. Um, and we'll share them at the end of this session. So we'll see how many different versions that we can have of Gary peeking out of the box and being surprised. Matt, why don't you pick up as far as what would be the very first step? We've been given a script. Now, what do we do to break that down? Well, every, now here's the one thing you got to remember is we have a lot of examples of things we'll show today. Every artist can work different, which is kind of the fun part. You know, there's, there's a million different ways that everyone can do this. 
Uh, traditionally though, the way it works is uh, either the writer will work on his own or the writer and the artist will, you know, maybe have some phone calls or send some emails to each other and kind of collaborate on the story. But either way, at some point, the story is fully written and then it's handed to the artist. And usually the first step for the artist is to then do th something called thumbnails, which tend to be just small little sketches where maybe they lay out a, a sheet of paper and just start doodling out, you know, like, okay, there's gonna, you know, I need to have a top panel that has a person, you know, like, just make something up on a bicycle and so you start just sort of doodling that and then oh and then I have to have a panel of them talking with somebody and a panel of something else so before kind of committing to a big giant sheet of paper and doing everything for real artists like to do these little thumbnails and it's just little sketches and I have some examples of I, I don't have like professional ones you know that I have from other artists but I just have ones like that I've done where I've just kind of created just little tiny sketches in a sketchbook that represent, you know, panel one, panel two, panel three, panel four, where I'm just kind of like doing little tiny sketches. They're just ballpoint pen or pencil. And it's really just- you say just, that it's kind of a rough draft, Matt? Yes, 100% it's a rough draft. Something that can be on a scrap, you know, just a scratch piece of paper. Something that, you know, you're just, you're just trying to just kind of noodle out some ideas on how this thing might flow, how, how movement might happen, what type of, you know, how, how people might be positioned on the panel. And um, how often does the first draft and the final draft resemble each other? I'm assuming there's a lot of iterations. Between there's them. a lot, yeah. And because what will happen sometimes is the artist will take those little, those little thumbnails and will send it back to the artist and ask, you know, is this kind of what you're thinking? And a lot of times there's good collaboration at that point. Like, oh, you know, it might be cooler if we do a big picture of this action and, and or, you know, the real focus is these two talking. So let's make that more important um, but then the artist will kind of use that as a roadmap and then some artists will actually scan that and blow it up and put it on tracing paper so they have an idea and then other artists it's just literally just a scratch piece of paper on the side to get them going and they kind of just reference it like look at it like oh okay you know I think I will do it like this and they just start working for real it also sounds like Matt you have some other people look at your work as well so you're getting inputs it's not necessarily all coming from you to make sure that it makes sense to somebody outside of your head that the story makes sense. Yeah, for sure. And I think in a collaborative environment, it's really important to do that. And I think even if you're just doing your own personal project, like it's this sometimes comic book good, creation. Yeah. It's sometimes good just to have it on, you know, to do those doodles, set it down, go get a sandwich, come back and relook at it. Cause then some, sometimes it just, you know, something pops in your head and you're like, Oh, it'd be cooler if I did this. And you haven't ruined anything. You just grab another little sheet of a post-it note or something and doodle a new idea on it. You're not, you're not kind of committing. You're not having, oh, I got to redraw all of this now, you know, because it's just the idea stage. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick up on that too, Matt, because I, I love what you said there. Um, I can't tell you how many times after I've stepped away from the drawing table, I, something will all of a sudden click in your head. But I wanted to show some of the sloppy copies that I've kind of used as layouts too. And you can see that they're, they're throwaway drawings. They're just kind of to help you with the composition and figure out how you want to put things in there. And while you're doing that, you want to remember, you want to save some space for a word box if you have one. And typically there's going to be a word box or a word bubble. And a word bubble oftentimes is, that's what the character is speaking. That's what their dialogue is. And one of the things that my kids sometimes do is they'll make the bubble and they'll attach the tail of the bubble right into the mouth, right into the mouth of the <laughs> character that's speaking. And it's like, you don't have to put it right into the mouth. Have the tail come too, you know, close to the character's mouth, but it doesn't have to be touching that. People can really understand how that works. But here's another really sloppy version of these layouts. And then as you go, you can start putting more time into the sketches and the layouts. Your layouts can be almost finished artwork and it makes that finish, the finished artwork that much easier to do. When I was growing up and when I was younger, if I started a drawing, I would wanna get it finished on the same sheet of paper. And if it wasn't perfect, I'd throw it away. And it was so frustrating because rarely was it perfect. It was almost never perfect. So you'd end up throwing it away so much. But as an adult and as a creator later on, you start realizing that there are ways to actually correct your mistakes using the computer 
and using uh, tools that you can use, whiteout and other tools, or even pasting a whole panel down onto a, onto a sheet so that'll save you so much time and your end results will look so much better. Matt, now that we have our thumbnails figured out, what is the next step? Well, what most artists do, and not everybody again, but most artists will go to what's called penciling. And that's where you start off with just, just exactly what it sounds like, just with your regular pencil. It can be just one of these great little yellow pencils, mechanical pencil on your full sheet of paper. Um, and traditionally comics are created larger than, the, the original art is larger than the final piece. And that's done, um, there's a variety of reasons, but mainly so that your artwork, it always looks better when it's shrunk down. You can get more detail on the page. So I have a couple examples of things uh, that show the pencils of, uh, these are real um, original pieces. This is a penciled page uh, from an artist named Jay Lee and he had done a series, uh, he had adapted Stephen King's Dark Tower series for Marvel Comics. Uh, so this is a fully penciled page. But the idea here is that you work in pencil, why? What's the best reason you screw up you can do a little erase, it's easy to fix. And just, I think most people just think in terms of pencil because you're just kind of light, you can be a little more gestural um, and then you can slowly, slowly be penciling it in a way that gets tighter and tighter until you're happy with it. So a nice transition to show that, um, like this is a page, another Marvel page. This is from um, an artist named Michael Lark and he was working on a book uh, as Captain America and the Winter Soldier, which you might've heard of the movie. So this is a, a pencil page, it's just done on light, kind of cheap, um, just regular printer paper page. Um, I'm not sure how great you can see this, but these are pencils. And then what a penciler does is either they ink it themselves. I don't know if you want to get right in the inks, but I can show a transition here, a nice transition. Sure. Um, because I have the pencils and I have the inks. So then what they do is they then transfer it into black ink. And you can see the difference of how much more impactful and final and sharp you know, that it all looks by having the inked pages versus the original pencil pages. So Matt, when you say that it gets inked, does somebody put it in pencil, then they give it to somebody else and that person traces the pencil in ink? That is, it's not yes. just tracing. In a <laughs> nutshell, but the tracer line is always like, you say that in front of an artist and they usually all they'll want to fight you or something because we're all just learning here that's though. Totally, so we like were running, using the word that we understand. Yes. Yes. We're it's like the running joke in comics because the, the, the penciler tends to be, you think of it like in movie terms, they're more like the director. They're the ones who are creating the shot or the cinematographer. They're the ones who are capturing kind of like through a lens. Here's how this shot works. This character is going to be walking down, you know, walking down a hallway and they're going to, step over something there's going to be a conversation so they're kind of creating that lens of you know is it a tight shot is it a far away shot so the inker then goes in and there's two ways either the pencil pages are literally handed to the inker and that person inks right over the top or what happens today especially you know with circumstances like we're living in now with everybody remote is you'll scan it send it to someone else they'll print it out usually in what's called blue line just because when you photograph that blue, it, the camera doesn't see it. So they'll use that as a guide and essentially, like you had said, trace, but what they're really doing is they're enhancing those lines. They're taking, a lot of times pencilers might be a little rough or like or a little quick, like hair. They just might go scratch, scratch, scratch to represent hair. The inkers, the ones who are going in and really fleshing out those hair lines, making everything perfect, adding depth. Um, a, lot of, a lot of the artwork goes to the inking as well. It's, it's really a dual thing. And, most artists today, you know, it used to be two separate people because of speed. We gotta get 30 or 20, 30 pages done every month. So it's a speed thing. Today, those deadlines are a little more lax and I think artists are more comfortable doing it themselves and wanna do it themselves. Um, more artistry as opposed to, you know, kind of commercialism um, in the way maybe it was done before. Uh, so it's, it's, it's a choice, but it, you know, it, it's definitely an important part because it helps finish the artwork. So our comic creators who are listening to us today, it sounds to me like you would encourage them putting it in pencil first to get their ideas down and to make sure the whole story is done, but to save enough time to go back over it in pencil 
to add some of that drama to it. To yeah, give that's, it that, that's a great way to put it. Okay. Yeah, that's perfect. You know, and you can look at it as, like you said, making certain things more dramatic, making things darker. And, you know, professionals use ink, but you could just use a, a pencil and just a much darker or heavier pencil too. What you want How are those you final that? lines. You know? well, before before we do that, I wanted to show a penciled piece too. This is by an artist by the name of Caesar, and he never um, he never inked this. He never finished this piece. Um, but the amount of detail that you could find in the pencil work is pretty uh, amazing. The art kits that you guys have, there was a set of colored pencils like this, and that was ultimately what you guys are supposed to use as your toolkit. And you didn't get any inking tools. And the professional uh, level artists will use inking tools. And Matt and I will both show you some of the tools that we've used that um, can help you guys make your lines even more distinct. But there have been artists who have drawn their entire comic books using just pencil. But you can see that they really made a distinct dark difference in what they do and then actually when they scan these pages too there is something that's done a little bit differently there so you can make your comic pages using just pencil it's it's a little bit more difficult to print it with that punch that you'd see on some of the other pages but it is possible so what most artists will use is a combination of pens and brushes um, and there's a, there's a million different types you can use and don't be, a, you know, you don't have to have the fancy expensive ones from an art store. You can use anything. You know, some artists will use Sharpies, some will use just regular ballpoint pens. I really like to start, uh, two, my two main weapons that I like to use are, um, one is called a Micron pen, which are these little felt tip pens. They have a bunch of different little sizes. Some are fat, some are skinny, and it's for drawing different different line weights. Let me grab a piece of paper here. Uh, different line weights that, you know, you can draw like a little box, you know, but it just, it's very thin. You could use it to draw any shape you wanted, but you can see it's always one line weight. It's always just the, the same width as your pen. Well, another tool that a lot of artists like to use, and some use a, mar a brush pen. You can maybe see it a little better here. A brush pen, which you can use either as something like this that has ink that goes into this pen, or some people have a little bottle, like a little jar of ink that they'll dip in, like a, um, a quill or some other type of actual brush into real ink. But what's great about a brush pen is it lets you do everything from thin to very thick just by how much pressure you push down on the brush. See how that, how you can do really good fats, cool lines, but then you could also do just faint, 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 you know, like light little stuff too, depending on how much, it's a little hard for me holding it up, but it's all about how much pressure you put down on the, on the paper with the brush. So I love these. I, I, I think to me, using pens like the Micron is really awesome for little detail. And if you really want something to be precise and shaped, then I use these because it's more, um, it's more detailed. It's just it's almost more, more mechanical. But using a brush pen to me adds so much life to a piece of artwork. It makes things more expressive. It lets you be a little sloppier or a little um, just and kind of just let the magic of the brush and the ink take care of some things. You know, like when you're drawing a tree and you've got all those leaves. If you use a micron pen, you kind of have to draw each leaf on its own because it's just this little tiny line. When you use this big brush pen, you can use, you can kind of just go, you can kind of smoosh it around and let the bristles get all kind of funky on the paper. And all of a sudden you get this really great little pattern that feels natural. And you know, you can kind of make it just seem like the shadowy parts of a tree or, or maybe the hair, you know, you just kind of, you know, and you just kind of smoosh your brush around. And next thing you know, you got this great hair, you know, hair pattern. So to me, I really like the organicness and the looseness of a brush. But again, you can use anything. There's no rules here. Matt, um, have you ever used a nib? This is this is a nib right here, gang, which is just like a little point. You dip it into the ink and um, you draw that. It. it gives you super fine line. Yep. Um, I've used it a little bit, but 
to me it's so fine and it, it kind of it's scratchy you know like you kind of like oh, even when you, you know when you're drawing you kind of hear like scratch 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 um i i think they're cool and what i like about it is that you can use real india ink you know which is like the blackest of black inks that you can use um so i re i really like that i just personally like the sort of disposability and the ease of you know like a marker like a, that i like to use like these I can put them right in my pocket. I don't have to worry about having a little ink brush or, you know, and, and water and, uh, you know, a little dish to put this liquid ink. I can just, boom. I, so I like the mobility and sort of the ease of just using markers. This summer, I got a chance to take a class with Joe Kubert and actually with Carly Eide. And we did some inking and this was inked with a brush. You recognize that guy at all? And I was super happy with kind of how the results were. And it wasn't something that I typically use. And also these nibs, I don't typically use these either, but I got a chance to do some cool things with that. My tool of choice is the Faber-Castell markers where you use the microns. I really like the Faber-Castells. But the thing that I'm kind of learning from you and from other artists is that like I'll use the brush tip to start with to get my big, heavy, thick lines. And then I'll, I love to go back in there to get some of the fine lines using, I mean, there's some of these, some of these are super, super sharp. And um, it gives you a lot of control of the line work that you want, where you can go from a heavy line. And a lot of times you'll, you, you can use a heavy, heavy line on something that's in the foreground, because it gives this distance. And when you get to a background line, you can keep it super fine. And it gives that illusion of atmospheric perspective. So it's like the blacks in the foreground are really rich and black and close to us. And the blacks in the distant are a little bit more muted. And actually sometimes you can even soften it with it, turn it into grays instead. But another tool that I like to use is um, a Sigma, I don't know. This is a white, white pen. It draws with white ink. And a lot of the whiskers that I'd put on my drawing here were just drawn with this pen and it really worked fantastic. And I've looked for a lot of different places to try to find a tool that does what this does. And i um, very happy with that. It's kind of weird because we were talking a little bit before we started the session about some of these techniques that are antiquated and gone. I can't find a jar of Pelican White to save my life. And that was a super thick um, type of a, a white paint that you could paint and it would cover things so well. All of the stuff that I've seen now currently never covers it quite as well as that Pelican White did. So I don't Greg, know. Greg, I have, I have a couple examples just to show that that would kind of illustrate these different tools. One of them, this is a page um, that was done all, I don't know how great you can see it. This was done all with microns. This is, this is um, an artist from a book from Image Comics. And you can see how everything is very tight. You can see all these little lines. And then they're also using that, uh, like a white gel pen that you're talking about to get some of the highlights in this black area. So it looks like they colored it all in black and then went over and did a few highlights in white. Look but, at how the lines are thicker too, Matt, in the foreground. Yep, yep. And that, those are all just good decisions that the artist is making. But you can see how it's just, it's really tight and everything's, when, when we say tight, it just means very clean. Like everything is, um, every line is measured and it's, and, and it's all kind of sharp and in focus. And then a contrast to that, this is from an artist named um, Tommy Lee Edwards. He's one of my favorites. And this is a fantastic four page that he had done. And this is all done with brush. So you can see how much more gestural this is. And, you know, almost to the point of saying sloppy but it has so much life in it. And I think so much sort of emotion and in the moment, you kind of get a sense of movement just by how some of these lines are just, just fetched, you know, just sort of whipped in the shape. Um, I don't know, a, I just think it- sounds like a it's, thinner sheet of paper, Matt. It is, it's actually, um, it's almost like a butcher paper. Is that what he used? Yeah, yeah. So it's just kind of a neat, comparison to show how somebody with a brush might work versus somebody with a, with a pen. I think we could show a couple of other examples too. This is a page that I just picked up. It, this is a Greg Land page. 
from the Mighty Avengers. The thing I want to talk about with this page is how there's such an awesome balance of black and white. So if you look at this, the artist really used a lot of black to highlight um, and, and accentuate the negative space in some of these panels. So when you're creating your own artwork, think about what you can do to kind of create that distance and that and that feel in the background. Also, how, how do you think they got some of these stars? Matt, have you ever made stars like that? Yes, I have. How did you do it? Um, well, it's, a, it's an old trick that I learned and I, there's probably a bunch of different ways to do it. I've Before I learned this trick, I did them all by hand where I would sit and colored that whole background, you know, over, I shouldn't say colored, but you know, sort of inked that whole background just trying to make all these little circles took me hours and then I learned the best trick that took me 30 seconds. I put a little bit of white paint. Well, first of all, I, I that painted that whole black background black Then I took some white paint and I dipped it with a toothbrush. So I just had the bristles of the toothbrush that just had sort of a light coating of that, that paint. And then I just went with that toothbrush and just sort of like, just had my thumb just sort of thoop, 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 and it splattered right down onto my paper in a perfect pattern. And I just, you got to test it. You don't want to do it on your good finished drawing right away. You know, maybe just test on a little sheet of paper next to you. But then once you get a good feel for that little, that little flipping, you just start. <laughs> the next thing you know, you got a star field. It's a great trick. I, I figured you would have done that before for sure. Yeah. This piece of artwork right here was one of the pieces that Mark Grunewald sent me. And this is drawn by John Byrne, who is absolutely one of my favorites. And this guy here influenced the, a lot of the artwork that I do myself, super clean lines. So what he did was he was just real purposeful and actually his inkers were really purposeful with the lines that they did. But now there's becoming, there's, there's a lot more trend to do more experimental type stuff with the ink lines. And this here is a page from a comic called Rumble and you can see that this artist just kind of whips some of that stuff through there and kind of uses white paint and spatters it. And, um, but again, like Matt was talking about, it gives this real big impact, this passion that other artists won't necessarily get with that super sharp, clean, purposeful lines. And this is stuff that I'm just starting to learn a little bit more about as far as how that can enhance my own artwork. But um, Matt, do you have any examples of sing things that are a little bit more splashy or crazy or, or laid out in that way? Well, like I said, you know, like I showed that one Fantastic Four one is pretty splattery, but this is kind of a cool example too. This is from a Russian artist that I've become a big fan of. And you can see he's using just about every tool there is. He's using pens, he's using nibs, he's using brushes. And even like to achieve some of these like textures, he's using his thumbprint. He's kind of ink, putting ink on his thumb and just sort of smooshing it into the page or maybe using, I've seen some people too, where you break an eraser, like an old pink eraser. And you kind of get the, you know, when you pop an eraser, you get that sort of textured pattern on there. Cause it, you know, it's kind of grainy. And sometimes you put a little ink on that and you use it almost like a stamp and you can, and then you get some, you know, you get some texture. And that might be how, you know, you texturize, you know, some wood at the bottom or how you just create some shading in the stucco, you know, the texture of the wall up here. Um, but it's, it's, the trick is, and you know, I, we, we talk about all these tools, but everyone has access to something, you know, it might be just a pencil, it might be a broken eraser, it might be whatever, you can use anything, you know, so don't think you have to have the, the most professional pens. Um, you know, the best, some of the best drawings I ever did is on a loose leaf, you know, like on my note, my spiral notebook in school that has all the blue lines through it. You know, you just got to find, find materials that work for you that you're comfortable with and be as expressive as possible and just make comics. I mean, it's the coolest stuff. So use whatever you can. The kids that are following us, do you have any tips that you've learned from your now second year in the comic book creation challenge or do you have any challenges that you're noticing right now as you're creating your comics? One hard thing is that whenever I uh, sketch out a really complicated character that I'm going to use a lot in the story, it's really hard to draw him again and again and again in different poses. Yeah, that's a, that's a common thing. A lot of artists will do uh, what they call style guides, which is kind of a fancy way to just to talk about like in their sketchbook, 
they'll come up with a character like, okay, it's it's a boy who wears a hat and, um, you know, or, or a guy who has a vest on or something. And then you just draw it 20 times. And you might want to draw them this way or this way or looking down or, you know, looking up. And you kind of draw it enough times that you get a sense for, okay, he always has this. He's got these kind of big ears or he's got this type of beard. Um, and he just kind of helps you kind of get a sense for who that character is and what he looks like. I think um, Rob Momarts actually showed a couple of his drawings last week and they had a front side back and another side view of the characters. So they were almost character studies, but um, I think can see how that would be very helpful. We talked a little bit about that then too. All right, gang, it is time to turn in your drawings. Let's see what we've got. The story was Gary peeked out of the box and was surprised. So what type of results did we come up with? Hi, Avery, good to see you. Is Eli with you too today or is it just yeah. you? Yeah. yeah, this is actually mine. Oh, yeah. fantastic. Very nice. How did you do that shading there, Eli? Well, I, I, all I did is what I'll do is I'll go really lightly over it and then I'll go slightly farther in and then I'll go darker and then I'll just keep doing that till I get to the edge. That's really great. You've got some good shading going on there. Thanks. Talia, you're ready, it looks like? Yes, I am. Let's, Let's see, see what, what you did while you were driving home. Holy oh, goodness. that's fantastic. Oh my gosh. That's exceptional. That's great. Thank you. What was the hardest part to that? I think figuring out what was going to be on this side. What did you use to get such a nice dark line? Uh, just, just a normal pencil. Well, you, you did a good job. And, and I, when I talk to my kids about using their pencils, um, you can use your pencil like a Hulk or like a ninja. And you want to really use it like a ninja if you can, because that's where you're going to get some of those light tones. But when you get to the final lines where you want to put some darkness to it, you can be a, I, I can see now that you can be a little bit of a Hulk. And there's, that's all right, too. <laughs> So Ruin, wrap us up. Let's see what you got. Well, I made, uh, what's his name? The person who's surprised coming out of the Gary. box? Gary. Uh, yeah, I made him a half dog, half cat. Oh He's my goodness. coming out of the box, being surprised at this random, tiny, stubby clown with a Santa hat. <laughs> I love it. That's fantastic. It looks like, Ruin, you use markers right away. Are you doing that with your comic design, too, or are you using pencils no, for that? No, I'm using pencils, but uh, hey. this edge is pretty rushed because I was also working on the cover for my, uh, the, the actual Whoa! drawing that I'm... Oh, can we uh, see that again? The drawing that I'm using for the... It's not backwards for you, right? Yeah, that no, good. that looks great. Okay, no spoilers. <laughs> no spoilers. But it looks like you're getting kind of further along in the process. Have you run up to any challenges telling the story or how to draw any lines or how to show anything that you'd like to ask these guys while you have their ear? I'm not really that far into the story right now. I'm still thinking of the script to it, so. Okay. I did. Um, I have like a ton of just uh, random covers for it. And at the end, I'm just going to pick which one I like the most. Matt, maybe you could talk about that. How long does a story live in your head before it goes in paper? And what are the benefits of kind of doodling something to kind of get you over those roadblocks of storytelling? Yeah, I, I've had stories that I've had in my head for 10 years, and I've had stories that I started working on and finished that same week. For me, personally, I need a deadline. So knowing that there is an assignment and it's due on Friday or it's due at the end of the month, that kind of helps motivate me to get, you know, okay, I got to put some time on the drawing table today and I got to work on this. And sometimes when I'm doing other work or if I'm at the dinner table, I'll have my little sketchbook with, and just in case a little idea pops up, I can, you know, I can doodle something. Um, but for the most part, I try and set aside time um, that is specific to a deadline. I'm in that same boat too. Um... I've got a project that's been sitting in my portfolio for 20 years. Actually, a lot of projects sit for 20 years. Um, and 
if there's no reason or urgency for it, it's easy to prioritize something else. And, and that, that really becomes a problem when, like I've got a beautiful children's book that should, be, should have been illustrated 20 years ago. And um, I just have such a hard time getting at it because it becomes more and more, it's gotta be at a certain level more and more as it builds and I and and I'm defeating my own self and the weird thing about this is is that my children's book is about procrastination <laughs> um, or it can be about procrastination so it's it's an actually a victim of that very same thing well, um, let's hope that our comics who are with us today who are getting their comic book done for the Mark Grunwald comic book creation challenge heeds this advice you got to put a little bit of time into it every day either in your mind or in your hand hopefully both to be able to meet that deadline you want to be able to have time to perhaps have somebody else look it over to make sure that there aren't any plot holes that you're missing you might want to give yourself some time to do it both in pencil and then to do it in darker pencil or marker to be able to add some of that pizzazz or drama or depth to your pictures so you have about three weeks to get it done. You can get your comics turned in at House of Heroes, Zeroni's, Winnebago Area Literacy Council, or the Oshkosh Public Library. Next week, what are we gonna be learning about, Craig? Awesome, next week what we're gonna be covering is we're gonna be talking about finishing up our comic pages. So we're gonna talk, Matt and I will talk a little bit about coloring and um, finishing some things. Um, with the next session, but we're also going to kind of go a little bit more in depth with that and potentially creating your covers um, and possibly even a little bit about promotion and what you can do to get your, your artwork out there and some of the venues that are available. I'm sure a lot of the illustrators that are watching this on our Facebook page have some questions that come up. Please put those in the comments. We'll either relay them to Craig or Matt or we'll do our best to answer them on our own. Thank you guys very much. You guys have a good rest of your evening. Thank you guys. Yep, thank you.